Good morning and thank you for joining us. Um, we're gonna give it just a couple minutes for people to jump on. Good morning. If you're just joining us now, thank you so much. We're just going to give it a couple minutes while people are entering into Zoom. Perfect. I think we can get started. Um, good morning. Thank you for joining us. I'm Nina Newman, Director of Admission and Financial Access at King School. Um, and I am joined today by a number of members of our athletic uh, department, although certainly not the entire group. Um, but we're really excited to talk to you today about um, the role that athletics plays uh, at King School as part of our co-curricular program. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the panelists and let them introduce themselves. And then after that, we'll open it right up into Q&A and make sure that you get all of your questions answered. At the end of the athletics piece, I will spend a few minutes talking about the application process. Um, so we'll focus initially um, on the athletics piece and, and let um, these panelists spend their time answering your questions. And then when they have to jump off to go back to their other work, um, I will work with you on the application component. Um, so Micah, do you want to kick it off? Yes, thank you, Nina. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to have you on the call today. Uh, we're really excited to be able to share information about the athletic program and uh, from my seat as the Dean of Athletics and the coaches and department members you're going to meet today, you're going to get a sense of the passion and commitment that we have in creating a tremendous experience for our student athletes as they come to our programs uh, and, and share in the opportunities that we provide through a really diverse set of uh, programs, teams, sports for our um, students all the way through uh, graduation. So my name is Micah Haubin. Again, I'm the Dean of Athletics here at King School. This is my fourth year at King. I do have two children here. My son Mason is in sixth grade and my daughter Sydney is in eighth grade. Uh, so we're fully invested in this community, which is just a tremendous community. And one thing I'll say for all of you on the call today, it, it is really a great place to be a, a new student. Uh, it's really warm and welcoming. Uh, and we do encourage those students as you think about coming into King, whether it's in middle school or upper school, uh, to think about those athletic opportunities that connect you to a lot of different areas of the school as you transition here um, coming into our community. So just a, a few general points, and then I'm gonna have our other panelists share information about their backgrounds um, and the roles they play before we start with some Q&A. In the chat right now, I am going to share uh, a link to our most updated athletic information page. So while we know you have lots of questions for us today, this page does have general information about our department, our department members, and uh, also on the second page has a list of all of our sports that we offer uh, in a traditional year for our upper school students and our middle school students since grades six to eight. So I'd encourage everyone just to use that link. You can reference it for programs and questions you might have. And I think it's a good starting point uh, as we get into the call this morning. Uh, so for our athletic program, we really value the experience of each one of our student athletes. And that shows in the passion and commitment our coaches uh, exhibit every day and every week when they share in the engagement with these athletes. Uh, we do look at this as an opportunity for every one of our students who would like to participate to give them that chance. We don't cut from the sports, but what we do is we add teams as there's interest, and then we evaluate those students to be placed in the correct uh, team within that sport. And for our middle school programs, um, in a traditional year, non-COVID year, we have our students participate in three seasons of sports that are built into the school day. Uh, so students will participate, if you're looking at that sheet in, in a program, each of the fall, winter, and spring seasons. For our upper school program, we require one sport per school year, but we have many students that play two or three sports uh, and have tremendous commitments within more than just one uh, program for us. Uh, we really value the life lessons that come with sports. So although our coaches are going to put our athletes in the best position to be competitive and successful, it is not a win at all costs. We are more about the pathway 
and the experience and the rewarding and beneficial uh, opportunities that our students get coming through our athletic programs. When we think about the, the pillars of our uh, athletics, as you can see behind me with the screen, this is our brand new uh, showcase turf facility right in the middle of our campus. Uh, this is for several fall and spring sports, and you can see just a phenomenal uh, example of the commitment King has made to our athletic programs and facilities for all of our students. Uh, the experience of the athletes, as we talked about, we run leadership uh, and character development programs for our athletes and our coaches to be able to continue to develop not only as better athletes, but as better people. And when we think about the core values of our program, uh, we strive to focus on commitment, leadership, teamwork and perseverance. And we feel that this year, especially uh, all of those values have truly been something for us to absolutely consider with our athletes every day. Uh, just a couple more points and I'll hand it over to the other panelists. We do have two athletic trainers on staff to take care of our athletes uh, with any proactive natures of preventative work and injuries. We have strength coaches on staff that work with our students uh, after school on the weekends over the summer to prepare them in season and out of season. As I talked about, we, we do a number of character and leadership development programs. Uh, on the call today, we have our coordinator of diversity, equity, and inclusion for athletics. And we also have one of our college counselors and our director of athletic um, leadership and experience, who is our dedicated college counselor for those students that are considering moving on to play sports in college. So uh, that's, that's a really quick overview of our programs. Uh, we look forward to connecting with you on that sheet is contact information for all of us. So please feel free to reach out. And I'm now going to pass uh, the floor over to Emily Prince, again, who is our field hockey coach, college counselor dedicated for student athletes, and our director of student athlete leadership and experience. So the floor is all yours, Emily. Hello, good morning. Thank you, Micah. Uh, my name is Emily. Uh, before coming to King, I was a three-time All-American field hockey player at Princeton and a two-year captain. I'm almost more proud of the two-year captain part. Um, I graduated from Princeton. I worked in television as a post-production supervisor for eight years in the show ABC's Extreme Makeover. Um, all the while, organically on the side, I was coaching and running my own recruiting business. And then about six years ago, Tom Decker's persistence paid off and I accepted the job at King as a field hockey coach and a lacrosse coach. Um, fast forward a couple of years, about four years ago, a position to open up in the college counseling office and I jumped at the opportunity to grow professionally. Um, last year, my role grew to include the director of student athlete leadership and experience. And I'm very fortunate to help the students explore their styles of leadership and then learn how to lead their peers and themselves effectively. Um, when presented with a job at King, I not only saw an opportunity for me to grow, but also for my inc an incredible door open for my family and specifically my three talented children. Um, this is now their second year at King in the lower school and they could not be happier and I could not be happier. Um, I am so impressed with the faculty and their all around dedication every day to improving the lives of their students. And it brings me so much joy to see my children in their King gear nonstop. <laughs> I know they're reaping the rewards of this incredible place as I am and all the hard work of the staff will here every day. Um, thank you for being here and learning more about King. And now I'm gonna pass it on to Nate. Uh, Nate, you're on mute, Nate. Oh, can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Got it. Good morning, everyone. My name is Coach Nate Jean Baptiste, um, and I'm in my third year at King. Um, before I came to King, I played professional basketball over in Europe, in Germany, and France for over six years, um, and then moved back to the States and started my own basketball company, High Rise Basketball, where we just look to develop kids and, and get them to that next level from a basketball standpoint. Um, during my time there, Mr. Michael Harbin, who spoke initially on the call, uh, reached out to me about an opportunity to coach at King School. Um, initially, it was one of those situations where I personally felt this may not be where I want, wanted to be at the time, but the challenge that was presented was it was too much for me at that time where I wanted to be a part of that challenge. Um, the challenge that was present was the, the 
fundamental transitions and changes that we were looking to make from an athletic department. Um, and I think it started when Mr. Harbin became the Dean of Athletics a year before I reached here. Um, and I am just personally so proud of my guys and what they've been able to do and accomplish over the last few years and the changes we've made within the athletic department. Um, the accountability and something that's big for me is communication and just being able to communicate uh, consistently with each other, teammates, and just being able to be all on the same page. And I think that's something that has been a huge change for King, um, huge change for the athletic department. And that's something that you know, I, I hang my hat on and my goal is to continue to develop that piece of it. Um, at King, I also um, am the athletic, the, the, the athletic DEI coordinator. Um, and in that role, my ultimate goal is to continue to push the needle forward and bring awareness to where we are as a school, as a state, as a country. And we all know the youth is, is a big part of everything that happens. And it's really just to continue to look to invoke change and to create opportunities for everyone to feel included, to be a part of this change. And my goal and hope is with always with sports is that what we build from athletic department through DEI work will spill over into the hallways of King and into the student life. Um, and that's something that has been a huge undertaking, um, joining the parts of it. And it's just, I'm impressed at the energy that the students and the staff and the coaching staff has just continued to show. Um, and I'll continue to do this role. So I'll pass it on. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Ali Stoddard, and this is my sixth year here at King School. I am one of the physical education teachers here in the lower school. I teach all the grades pre-K through fifth grade, um, but I've also coached uh, soccer, basketball, tennis, cross country, and softball, predominantly at the middle school level, but I've also crossed into the high school level as well. Uh, our overall goal for the physical education program is to cha challenge and help students reach their fullest physical and social emotional potentials through various planned activities. This of course looks different at each grade level. Our hope is that by the end of fifth grade, as they're getting ready to enter the middle school athletic program, they will have a greater understanding of what sports and activities fit their own individual interests and feel confident about their abilities to actively participate um, as they cross into the next level. And what's great about being um, a coach for, you know, cross divisionally is that even though they leave the lower school, I still get to see them um, at the middle school level and continue to work with them on their skills and, and really develop their interests and their likings. And like Emily said, um, I have a daughter who actually is applying for King for next year and a son on the way due in April. So um, I'm excited for them, my kids to come here and experience the environment that King has. Um, it's a great place to be. So that's, that's me. I'm gonna pass it on to Guy. I am Guy Savage. I know uh, I've interviewed uh, many of the families on this call. So hello to you again. And to the families that I've yet to meet, it's. Very nice to meet you uh, virtually. Um, over my four years here at King, I've worn many hats. Uh, I've been a building sub, AP and study hall proctor, and uh, now in my current role as an upper school admission associate, where uh, I work closely uh, with the athletics department and prospective student athletes uh, through the uh, admissions process. Uh, in regards to athletics, I'm the, uh, the head varsity hockey coach uh, here as well as the uh, as well as one of the golf coaches outside of King um, I, I work as a scout and player development coach for USA Hockey and I'm also a coach for Mid Fairfield which is the number one uh, AAA youth hockey organization uh, in the country um, and I guess I will send it on to Nina now all right 
Thank you. Um, so that was a really great sampling of the different um, expertise um, on the call. And also, um, hopefully, we'll give you families a sense of um, the ways in which we reach into the community and into um, life beyond King in terms of colleges. All of the coaches are really helpful, um, no matter what level um, of play um, a, a student might want to play in college. Um, and so they sort of reach both ways, right? They coach outside of, of King, they work with our our families really closely while they're here, and then they help prepare them for whatever level of athleticism they want to go pursue afterwards. There is a feature in the bottom of the screen that says Q&A, and we would welcome you all to um, put your questions in there, and then I will direct the question to the right person, or you can identify who you'd like um, to ask. Um, and we'll go through the questions and, and make sure that everything gets answered. Um, one of the questions we get asked a lot is sort of how kids balance um, their work life um, with their athletics. Um, I think that one of the um, real benefits of being at an independent school is that um, the coaches really understand and the teachers really understand um, the ways in which kids are being um, pulled in different directions. And I'm wondering if, um, one of you varsity coaches might just sort of share how you and teachers work together, whether it's, you know, a late away game or, um, you know, a big, you know, midterms, um, you know, how do we sort of help make the um, student experience the, the priority? Emily, you want to start there? Sure. Well, first of all, I would like to sort of point out that one great thing about a student athlete is that they thrive on both the athletic and the academic experience. So it's sort of like the yin and the yang, they can't have one without the other. And the sport does mean a lot to them. Um, now that said, there are times when they might get overloaded. Say for example, there was an AP psych review session over the weekend. And one of the students had an away game up at the gunnery, which is about two hours away. And this actually happened to me. Um, and so it was sort of rare but this student was very stressed out and I gave her a pass on that game. So um, the great thing about us is we do value the whole experience for the students and we can make compromises, but at the same time, we do wanna make sure that there is a commitment level there. So um, they know that they have to go to, to, to their, their athletic experience from usually 3.15 to five o'clock in the afternoons. Um, and that is a devoted time for practice. And then for the travel, they should be making those games too. Um, but the teachers also for say an outside athlete, sometimes we have, we have athletes who play an outside sport, um, say for example, rowing. And our faculty is very good at allowing schedule changes or updates or accommodations to support that student. So a lot of times the rowers have to go to practice. It starts at 3.30 in Norwalk. And so they might have that last block free. And that's the amazing thing about our learning specialists in the upper school in particular is that we can make accommodations in the schedules for, for that exceptional student who is pursuing perhaps rowing um, outside of King. Great, thank you very much. Nate. Um, the next question is, um, do we have a policy in terms of student GPA levels for student athletes? Micah or Emily, do you want to answer that? Uh, King's philosophy around that is, is really the connections that we build. Uh, and when I say we, from the coaches in the department to the teachers and the counselors and the advisors. So we really get to know the students and our student athletes really well. So while we don't have a GPA level in place for participation, we really value the direct connections we have with the students and the families. So we're much more proactive in um, talking about and bringing forward any academic or social or other school-based concerns that might come up with a student before it gets to a point where we'd have to potentially remove a student from uh, participation from one of our athletic programs. I think, as Emily said, it, it really is about the commitment levels for the team. So if in a situation where students are not holding to those expectations of commitment and not coming to practice, those are times when we would you know, talk about uh, if it's the right team for a student to be on in the right season, when there are academic uh, concerns or, or someone is uh, needing additional support, then the coaches and the teachers and the advisors are all on board to support that student. Uh, all the way through that process of, of increasing either a, a particular grade or just kind of 
managing their time um, in a different way to, to do better academically, to let that student uh, perform in the classroom and hopefully out in the fields for us uh, in, a, in a more positive manner. Thank you. Um, switching gears a little bit, I think this would be a good question for Allie to tackle. Do you find middle school age students open to joining new teams? Uh, yeah, I can answer that. Um, I would say yes. But the great thing about the middle school athletic program is that each year and each for each season, they pick their own sport. So the the teams aren't necessarily the same from year to year. So every year there are new students coming in or athletes who maybe chose to play field hockey the year before but wanted to try soccer this year. So they've switched from one team to another. So a new student coming in is going to find that they're not the only one that's on the team who is unfamiliar with the, the rest of the kids or the coaches or anything like that. Um, it's always open for people to, to move around and find the interest that suits them the most. So the kids are, are very welcoming and um, you know, provides the opportunity for you to find a sport and a, and a home for you that you feel comfortable in. Uh, it, Nina, the one thing I'll add there is that we also at the middle school level, because we know students in grade six, seven, eight are coming with all different backgrounds. Some of you on this call will have years and years of club team and school experience and, and others won't. And so we do give a solid week to eight days of chances for those middle school students to try the programs and then make adjustments from there. That the entire King model for classes and performing arts and athletics is very flexible. So you're, you're never gonna be held to something if it's not the right fit, if it's not something that's comfortable to you. And we're gonna give all the students a chance to try out those programs. And again, some of you are gonna come in and say, these are the three sports I wanna play and this is what I'm gonna do. Others, you're gonna to wanna to try it out and give, give a chance to experience new programs. Uh, and you can even switch from year to year. And, and we, we really value that opportunity for those students to get that well-rounded uh, chance to play different sports and try some more fitness activities that may not be as team sports based. And then of course, uh, move into those team sports if they so choose down the road. Excellent. Um, here's a good question on JV and varsity levels. Does King compete against boarding schools or just day schools? Um, how far do they travel and complete? Maybe each of you coaches could just answer really quickly what your respective seasons look like in terms of how far and who. Guy, you want to kick it off? Sure. Yeah, um, we do play. Uh, it, we play in the FAA. Uh, so we play uh, many other private schools. Um, we don't currently play any, um, any of the boarding, any boarding schools, but that could change uh, in the future, but it does vary by, by sport. Um, I know our golf team, we go up and play, uh, we play against Kent, uh, et cetera, other, other boarding schools. So it really does vary, um, vary by, by sport. Um, I know Micah could, could speak to that as well. Yeah, we're, we're, I can speak to, we're in the um, NEPSAC, so the New England Prep School Athletic Conference. So the NEPSAC does include boarding schools for my particular sport, field hockey. Um, and so we compete in the New England tournament. Uh, my first year we made it to the New England tournament, which is pretty awesome. Um, but we do compete against some boarding schools. Like I said, we traveled to Gunnery um, and we play, we, we also play GA in the FAA, but uh, we played Cheshire Academy. And the good thing about our program too is we can have flexibility to change it if we need to. So for example, um, I know our women's basketball team uh, wanted a little bit more competition that was appropriate for their level of play. And so we changed our schedule and um, reached out to a couple teams and had the flexibility to, to play some other teams. So we, we have the opportunity to change it if we need to, but we definitely compete in the FAA and try to make the FAA tournament, that's pretty much our goal. Um, but overall, I think we're also in the New England Prep School Athletic Conference, the NEPSAC, which does include Taft and all the Hotchkiss, Choate, Loomis. Yeah, I'll hop in here as well from a um, boys basketball standpoint. We also compete in FAA and also part of the NEPSAC. Um, and we do play a couple boarding schools, which is not necessarily in our league, but they're in our um, the overall NEPSAC. Um, and because it's not a conference game, 
we have the flexibility to choose to play or not to play. Um, and I think the athletic department does a great job of going through what teams we want to play, when we want to play them. If there is a far game where we play near the West Point area, um, which is about a two hour trip, we will choose a day and a time that's sufficient for the school, our players, our student athletes, and also the families that want to possibly come in a chair us on. So we do play a couple of boarding schools from a basketball standpoint, um, but for the most part, we're playing all Fairfield County teams and teams in, in, that's involved in the, the FAA. Great, thanks, Nate. Um, there are a couple of questions about preseason and tryouts. Um, Micah, maybe you could tackle that, um, certainly about the fall, um, but I think it's a, it's a question maybe season by season. Yeah, so it's it's a great question for all you thinking about, um, you know, coming into a new school community and really trying to uh, understand better the flow of the year. So in a, in a traditional year, and right, we know this has been a, a challenging year and a very unusual year for many reasons, uh, sports certainly being one of those. In a general non-COVID year, the preseason in the fall would start two weeks uh, prior to Labor Day. And while we don't know exactly what those dates will look like for this coming um, you know, fall season, we would say that as you look at your summer calendars for those fall athletes, that to look two weeks prior is, is around the time that we would say you should start to prepare to uh, have some uh, athletic activities or things going here at King. You know, whether it's the Tuesday or the Thursday that week, that's still to be determined. We also, I would also say even backing that up is if the students that are accepted and enrolled at King, once our school and school year ends and your school year ends this current year, you are considered to be part of our athletic program. So a lot of our coaches run summer uh, workouts, some run summer camps, some of them um, we partner with other outside groups where we have clinics and workshops and different things. And all of those opportunities would exist for all of you that are again accepted and enrolled here at King to start to work out with our teams over the summer. Uh, unlike some uh, organizations and, and public school models in the New England Prep School Association and the FAA, there are no restrictions for our coaches over the summer. So our coaches can fully coach teams and coach Nate uh, when we play in a summer league has the chance to coach all of our athletes. Uh, if Emily has the field hockey girls, either in an indoor league or an outdoor league, she's able to coach them. So when you think about the summer, while the preseason starts one to two weeks ahead of school, just understand that there are gonna be opportunities to engage with our athletes and coaches all the way through the summer. And as Nina talked about, it is also important to think about for the other seasons, as you think about winter and spring, our winter programs typically start um, just before Thanksgiving, middle of November. Uh, we do generally have activities, some games, practices over the winter break. So if you're thinking of being a varsity athlete for a winter team, just understand that that's part of it. And then the winter season goes typically until around the first week in March. And then the, it's a week or two overlap as we begin the spring season. Uh, right now for the spring break time, it's two weeks later in March. And for those of you who are spring athletes at the upper school level, you want to also think about that typically the second week of that break is used for either travel, um, for training for our spring teams, or actually beginning seasons where you're playing and practicing. And with the turf field again behind me in our south turf, we have ample uh, turf facilities to allow for practices and uh, events to start kind of before we generally think about you know, the, the warmer weather. Uh, and one thing I'll say too, is we have a phenomenal uh, program as part of our interdisciplinary work with global education and service learning. And so we do, when we move past this pandemic and are able to open up travel again, uh, teams go down to Florida to train, uh, teams may be going out West to train. And we also have um, put in place interdisciplinary programs for again, global education and uh, service learning where we send uh, athletes potentially down to uh, Dominican Republic for some baseball and softball training. Coach Nate took part in our first boys basketball trip to China. Uh, Coach Emily and Coach Nate were, or Guy are talking about other opportunities to get our athletes more experiences with service learning and global education to really open their eyes to everything that sports can do to build relationships, bridge gaps, 
uh, help with just a, a general communication. Uh, and we think it's a really tremendous program here and something that uh, we look at the, the, the limits are really what we can work to provide the greatest opportunity for our students and athletes coming through. And the only thing I'll say that Nina had asked about is with tryouts. So again, we're, we're not thinking about tryouts in what we consider like a traditional public school model where there are a certain number of spots within a given team and you have to try out for either the varsity or the JV or the freshman. And if you don't make one of those, you are cut from that sport. At King, if we have the interest levels, we will add a JV team or a second JV team to provide that opportunity for athletes to play. So while we do have tryouts, it is more of an evaluation process to determine the right team level for that student to, to participate on. So if we talk about boys soccer for a minute that isn't represented with a coach here, we generally carry a full JV team for that program. So when our students get there the week or two before school starts in August, they are training to be evaluated by the coaches to determine if they will make the varsity boys soccer team or the JV boys soccer team. Again, if the student chooses to make the commitment and wants to play soccer here, then they will have a spot in one of our teams to play soccer that season that they want to. Great, thank you. Um, there's a good question about um, resources for athletes, you know, tutors, that kind of thing. Um, and we talked a little bit about this at the beginning. Um, all of our students actually benefit from a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with their teachers. We have time built into the academic day, both in the middle school and in the upper school for um, kids to get extra help. It's not just when you're struggling, it's um, when you wanna write the best paper possible and you have a history teacher who's happy to work on the rough draft with you. Um, I think the the added layer of support that our athletes get is what we were alluding to earlier, which is really great communication and an understanding that um, our students are being asked to do a lot of things. We want them to be able to be superb students, top athletes, and committed to other things like the arts or a model UN. Um, and so because we encourage all of that, plus we want them to get a good night's sleep, we want them to have dinner with their family, um, we really do take a mindful approach to their scheduling. So I think that's probably the greatest uh, resource we offer our student athletes. Emily, there's a question about um, athletes getting enrolled in the leadership program. Could you talk a little bit about how that works? Sure. So my particular leadership program is for captains. It's a captain's council. And it's not only a way for them to explore their own leadership styles, but it's also a feedback system for our athletic program. So they can give us feedback on, um, for example, how the COVID protocols are affecting them this season or how their overall mentality is doing, um, how they feel our competitive spirits doing or whatever it might be. Um, how the practice rotation on the turf was. Uh, so there's a, a granular level of feedback that, that they can provide us. Um, so my particular program is for captains. And then I sort of relay the information to the coaches. Um, but there is a leadership distinction in the upper school that is a separate program. And that is something that you can enroll in uh, as a freshman. And then you pursue the certificate. So other certificates include the STEM, field, um, the leadership, and then there's a global studies distinction also. Um, the STEM field is probably the more challenging one. Global studies, you have to take certain prerequisites and classes in order to fulfill that. Um, but the leadership distinction is a fantastic opportunity that is capped with a capstone um, project your senior year. Um, there are leadership seminars, um, leadership foundation workshops. So a bunch of courses go into that distinction. Um, so, yeah, so a few ways to gain that leadership, um, perhaps like, again, that certificate um, or experience or training. Um, there's also ways to pursue leadership on the side. For example, um, Karen Rate runs a great King Cares program, and there are ways to, um, to get involved in your community in a leadership capacity. So we met with the Boys and Girls Club, for example, uh, a Monday before break and we're going to have two other follow-ups and it's um, about seven students that are freshmen to seniors that are meeting with other um, leadership uh, other leaders in the community over at the Boys and Girls Club um, and it was a great way for them to get together and collaborate and share their experiences through COVID and just in, te in the teen years in general um, so yeah lots of ways to get leadership experience at King. 
Thank you, Emily. Nate, could you just add in a little bit about the Student Athletes for Change? Yes, yeah, so earlier this school year, we had um, a form that we put together for all our athletes. Um, we call it Athletes for Change. And the idea and goal behind it was, again, to bring awareness to where we are as a school, as a state, as a country, um, but also to give each one of our student athletes an opportunity to speak on their experiences, past experiences, present experiences. We had some alumni on the call. Um, we had some brand new students first year at King and we allowed them to be able to kind of, it was a working session where they were able to take over the forum and speak pretty much within groups and breakout rooms and then bring it all together with some questions that we had formed in terms of their experiences. What would they like to see change? Um, what did they like, what did they, did, what did they dislike? their first day at King, their first day with the team. Um, and I think it was very beneficial because we got a lot of useful information out of it that what we're trying to create with that is also different affinity groups that we want to give our students an opportunity to, to lead. And lead is not always on the field, not always uh, in the forefront where everyone can see it, but it's behind the closed doors and, and galvanizing different groups to kids at the school and being able to just kind of bring them together and, and use it for the change that we're looking to make. Um, and to be honest, I was impressed with the students that did come on the call and also how they were able to articulate what they went through, what they're going through, how they're feeling. There was a lot of range of kids that enjoyed their time and still enjoying their time at King. Um, and we learned a lot about what we can do to make change to continue to develop I've led the department. So that was another opportunity for our student athletes to kind of speak out and, and be able to have their voices heard. Hey, Nina, I just wanted to mention one other thing. And it, as a parent of an eighth grade daughter who's an athlete, um, it, it, it hits home for me as well. And I'm going to just have Emily talk for a quick uh, minute on it. We, we do also run programs for female athlete leadership. Uh, in pre-COVID, so two falls ago, we did do a separate program for all of our female athletes to really start to celebrate and recognize uh, the work of those young ladies and as they develop into the athletes for us at the high school. Uh, and, and we think it's, it's really uh, valuable for those of our female athletes here now at King and coming in to understand uh, that place that they can play and the opportunities that can present themselves uh, through their middle school and high school um, sports experience here at King. And so Emily, maybe if you just want to talk about that quickly and then we'll move on to some other questions. Uh, sure. We had, I think it was a two day full training experience over at Chelsea Piers. Um, so starting at eight and ending up at about four, um, we had a full line of programming from a strength and conditioning trainer um, who runs her own Jim, uh, she's a blogger. She used to be a dancer who went to Fordham and danced at Lincoln Center. Um, and her blog is, uh, I might say a little bit of a curse word here, but it's, it's badass and beautiful. Um, and uh, she balances that line of being strong, but also being gracious and graceful. Um, and it's a really great lesson for the women to see how she asserts herself, but also balances that, um, um, more feminine role. We also had a nutritionist come in and uh, there was one tagline she used that was instead of um, diet and exercise, we fuel and train. Um, so kind of a, a different delineation there between um, diet and exercise for, for a strong female is actually like fuel and train. Um, so we, you know, we sort of talked about body image and um, and the challenges of being a female, uh, somewhat at a disadvantaged um, uh, gender for in our society. But it was a very empowering activity for our females and it was a great way for us to also bond. Uh, so that was, I think the first two days before school, we ran that and News 12 covered it and uh, we got sort of the run of the mill at Chelsea Piers and it was really awesome. Great. Um... This is a parent of a incoming ninth grade and an incoming eighth grade. Um, and just wondering about um, the time periods of the different athletics. So Allie, do you wanna sort of explain how middle school um, practices work and then someone else can give the time frame for 
the up the commitments on the upper school level? Or actually, Ali, you can answer both because you've co you've coached in both. Why don't you explain the differences? Uh, so sure. So for um, middle school um, this year, I know that they implemented two athletic periods for the middle school sports. Um, it, one starts, uh, it's built into the academic day. So one starts at 1130 and then ends at 12, uh, 25. And then there's an afternoon session um, that runs from 215 or 220 to uh, 310, 315. So that's for the middle school when they start and finish. Um, I know this year looks a little bit different given COVID. They, they've separated groups by grades so that kids don't you know, mix in with each other. But usually um, you would see kids from sixth grade to eighth grade all on one team during those specific times. I'm not sure how the, the morning will work you know, next year if things revert back to normal. And then for the upper school, sports practices start um, at 3.30 and then go until 5 or 5.30, I think, depending on the various sport. And Micah, you can add on to that as well for the middle school program with the changes that we've made this year also. Yeah, thanks, Allie. And, and as Allie said, the, the example for this year and the flexibility that King has in our learning model and our athletics model was that we have been able to continue to have in-person opportunities to engage our students both at the middle school and the upper school level for athletics. In the middle school, the way we managed to do that was to create a rotating schedule of those programs during the school day. Uh, up until this year, the middle school program was the last period of the school day for practices for certain sports, teams that are off campus, uh, a hockey, there's guys talking about uh, tennis, golf, squash, uh, crew, those middle school sports do happen uh, after school hours and competitions for both home competitions and away do happen after school as well. So uh, while it's not a clear line of middle school programs happening during the school day and upper school happening after the school day, uh, the upper school programs are, are all after school. So in a non-COVID year, if we were in school five days a week, then there would be practices typically five days a week. Uh, certain other sports have different um, you know, parameters. And again, if it's ice time at Stanford Twin Rinks, they may get four days a week on the ice and do an off ice training day. So within any given sport, there are going to be some variations there. But for our varsity athlete and most of our upper school athletes, you can think about having after school practices four to five days a week and then weekend uh, either some practices or as Coach Nate and Coach Emily talked about further uh, distance travel for some games on the weekends as well. For middle school, we do not have uh, weekend responsibilities or activities. And again, some of it is typically during the last hour of the school day, which then goes over uh, into the afternoon time, uh, again, with travel or competitions uh, for those programs. So a little bit different this year, uh, and we hope to continue to develop the model as we move through the spring uh, and summer to be able to really understand what next school year will look like for our teams. Um, Nina, I wanted to say something about the tutoring assistance, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so as a college counselor who helps student athletes go to college to play their sports, and as someone who went to Princeton and, and played sports, uh, it was very challenging. It's always a concern of mine to know what the academic support system and structure is going to be at that college. So I know at UConn, they have people travel on the bus with the athletes. They have an academic advisor that helps them pick their courses. So what is unique at King is that we actually do have an SST system that um, Micah helped implement where there is an internal teacher that is supporting the coach because usually the coach is external and the coach doesn't have the access to the academic or what's going on during the day. So that was a really cool feature that King added was someone who is a member internally and especially the SST um, can then help that coach understand what's going on in the daily life of the athlete. So um, it is a really awesome feature that King does help. There's also the academic pit that's in the bottom floor of the upper school. And there are peer led um, tutoring assistants there. And there's also of course faculty led tutoring services there. But as a college counselor and someone who's internal, I am just amazed at the swarm of people who do come around students and lend a hand. Um, sometimes it's almost overwhelming to see three different specialists come in and, and ask me about a particular student. So it really is phenomenal, phenomenal, excuse me. 
Excellent. Um, Guy, there is a question about specialization that maybe you could tackle. Um, sort of what is King's approach? How do we encourage kids? Do we encourage them to play multiple sports or to really pick one? Um, it, you certainly don't have to give a comprehensive answer, but just sort of from your experience, um, how kids manage that at King? Well, we here at, at, at King and, 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 and all the coaches feel that you should not specialize in a sport. I mean, there comes a time when you become 17, 18 years old, and maybe there is a sport that that is your path in college, but then you start to specialize. But, but no, we, we want students that, that, that play everything and, and take a chance. You know, we've had many hockey players that have decided I'm going to try lacrosse or, or, or what have you. I think there was a great stat um, from the uh, NFL draft uh, this past year, or maybe it was the year before, but out of the uh, first round draft picks, 90% were multi-sport athletes in high school. And, um, and you would think that those guys were just playing football all the time, all the time. Everything was about football and, uh, you know, it couldn't be uh, further uh, from, from the truth. So uh, we do want students that, that do play everything. We don't want someone that's just year round, year round hockey or, 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 uh, or what have you. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just noticing that we are over time, so um, I am going to let our panelists go. Um, if your question was not answered, I apologize. Um, but uh, as Micah said, he did include all of the contact information in the chat, um, and we'd be happy to answer that. Also, if you are um, in the middle of the application process, you will be interviewing with either Guy or me, Dana or Mark, um, and we would be happy to answer some of the spe specifics about um, the facilities we use um, and uh, transportation transportation and those kinds of issues. Um, I'm going to stay on for a couple minutes to go through the application process with you, but I would just like to thank our panelists for joining us today, for taking time out of their day. And I know that they would be happy to be in touch with you if you have further questions for them. So thank you, panelists. Bye. Thank you very much. Everyone have a great day. And <clears throat> please be in touch with any questions. <clears throat> our coaches are available to uh, follow up and, and looking forward to meeting all of you, whether it's on another Zoom call or hopefully in person down the road. And, and we absolutely appreciate taking the time with us this morning. Uh, and again, we look forward to uh, kind of some better, brighter times ahead and be able to get our kids outside and, and playing more uh, sports as we move forward here. So have a great rest of the day and week. And again, we look forward to seeing everyone soon. Thank you. Um, I can see that there are a lot of families on this call today, which is great. Um, my guess is that you're all at various stages of the application process. Some of you probably just dipping your toe into the water and some of you have completed applications and are eagerly awaiting the um, February 12th admission decision release date. Um, so if you have already started the process, Hopefully you have already been walked through um, the materials that need to be um, received. Um, and we are trying to finish up anyone who hasn't gotten them in yet so that we can return all of those decisions on February 12th. If you're just starting now, we are accepting applications on a rolling basis. Um, and basically what that means is we can't guarantee a decision by February 12th, but once your application is complete, we will um, have the admission committee review it and get to you, a decision to you as soon as possible. Um, so it's not meant as a discouragement, um, but just sort of a way to manage expectations in terms of when um, admission decisions will be uh, released. If you're applying for financial access, those applications were due December 14th, and the decisions will be also rendered on um, Friday, February 12th. Um, if you have missed that deadline, you should reach out to me by email, and we can talk about next steps and sort of how that works um, for people who missed that initial financial access deadline. Um, one of the questions we get a lot is about, especially for athletes um, is about personal recommendations. If you have a coach who um, really knows your child well, uh, we would love to hear from them. They can fill out the personal recommendation form that you'll find with our application. They could send us a letter or an email and we'll add it to the file. Um, we do think that um, coaches add valuable insight to a kid's character, work ethic, enthusiasm, uh, and yeah, even a level of play. Um, so it's great for us to have those letters. If you want to send them in, but there's certainly not a requirement. 
Um, I think that's about all I wanted to make sure we covered today, but um, my office really enjoys speaking with families. We feel like it is such a great way to get to know you. So if you have specific questions about your family, please give us a call and the person who oversees your division will um, chat with you and make sure that you really understand how everything works at King um, and get to know your family and, and we can decide if this is the right fit. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate an opportunity to tell you what a great athletic program we have and how it um, fits really well with our academic program and, and art program as well. I am going to send us off now. Thank you.